computer. All right, here we are with Brittany. Hey, what's up, Brittany? <laughs> welcome, welcome to the show. And uh, we're really excited to have you. Um, we are your hosts today, Coach Forrest and Anthony Steele. So let's get on. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Excited to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So, um, so Brittany, uh, we only bring the you know game changers and people who have been through that mind, body, spirit transformation into on our show because we know that because of your transformation, you can inspire other people, mm -hmm. and you know you can you can speak to them and understand that they may be going through a pain in their life or a life transition or something with their health where they want to improve or they just want to get better or feel better, right? right. Their quality of life. So. Um, that's why we're super excited to have you on. And especially for you, um, you know, your, your message speaks to everybody, but it definitely speaks to teens and, um, you know, in, in the high school and the college um, years, uh, you know, quite possibly even to middle school teens as well. Yes. Um, so we're super excited to have you on. Um, and I'll let you tell your story. I, I won't tell that. But can you tell me, um, first of all, what it is you do, like your accolades and, you know, what it is you do as an artist right now? Yeah. Um, well, at this point in my life, I have really taken on dancing as my main form of expression. Um, dancing for me has just been a way to express a lot of my emotions, uh, specifically emotions that I, I dealt with, you know, through my hardship. Um, that's kind of how I got into dancing. And so that's really my main form of art. I am a performing artist and um, I am self-taught. I started dancing actually after my, my uh, eating disorder, which I'm sure we'll get to talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so right now I, I, you know, I really taken on that and I noticed, you know, the, the incredible change that it does for people just like being able to view that. But the other thing that I'm really been involved in is, is speaking as, you know, I want to really get out there and speak about self identity and self image. Um, just because I learned so much in my, in my mission. Um, so yeah, I guess it's kind of hard to talk about what I, what I do without getting really to the root of why I do it. <laughs> yes, it will definitely. Yeah. But thank you. That's, that's perfect. And, uh, we met at a Lisa Nichols conference, right? Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hundred or a thousand people there, all with the interest of becoming better speakers and creating yeah. a platform, and that's where we connected. So that was so cool to connect with you there, and um, and it and and right there, you define just by stepping into that conference, you define yourself as a as a game changer, right? Definitely. Um, so let's so so you know self taught artist. I love that by the way. You know self taught that means you just like out of your own heart and expression just made that. Yeah. Up. It's like Definitely. Anthony and I, we're, we're self-taught entrepreneurs. Like no, <laughs> nobody taught our, <laughs> just make it happen. Just make it happen, right? Make it happen, right. <laughs> which, which is another powerful message inside of your message, right? Is uh, just making mm -hmm. it happen and not waiting for somebody's permission to, to right. bring greatness into the world. I love that. Um, Happy into the world. So let's talk about what ended you up here to where you're at, you know, perform. Cause you, you do like huge stages at, you know, massive concerts with thousands of people inspiring. Right. You send yourself up out on social media with these amazing uh, eccentric videos that are just beautiful and gorgeous that have a message and a dance and everything inside of it. Tell me about the background. What led you here? Yeah. So um, when I was about, let's see, 11, 11 years old. I, at the time of my life, I was doing so much. I was the top of my class. I was a straight A student. I was, you know, captain of all my sports teams. I was president of my school. I just had everything going for me. And it was a lot of pressure. And I feel, you know, like a balloon filled up with too much air. I was really ready to pop by the slightest mistake. And uh, so, for me at that time, you know, I was, I was very popular. I was smart. I had everything going and it was one thing that fell out of my control. And, um, what ended up happening is, you know, I was 
really looking to keep control over everything in my life. And so I ended up dieting and that was just really, you know, at 11 years old, that's kind of unheard of, but you know, I just started dieting and then it turned into more exercise. And then before I knew it, I was skipping meals. Um, so I think that, you know, a, a lot of people have this misconception about, you know, eating disorders, which is where my life started to head that it's mostly about being thin. But for me, it wasn't really about being thin. It was more so about having control over my life. Mm. So by the time I was 14 years old, before I even knew what, you know, eating disorders were, I was struggling with an eating disorder. And, um, at 14 years old, the doctors told me that I was classified as a severe anorexic. Mm. And, um, there was a very fateful day that my, I went to see a dietitian and my mother, uh, the dietitian told my mother, you need to immediately take her to the emergency room. And, you know, in that emergency room, I remember just feeling so numb in the midst of all this chaos, you know, they were poking and prodding me with needles. And so eventually they, you know, there's these, all these alarms going off, you know, they're hooking me up to all these heart monitors. And eventually the doctor took my mom outside and they came back in and, you know, he, he sat down with me and he looked me straight in the face and he said, I am so sorry. Your heart is beating at 33 pulses a minute and we have no idea how you're even alive right now. And he said, I, I'm sorry, but we, we don't expect you to live throughout the night. And so it was in that moment that I literally had to face my own end of my existence. And I remember just laying there in that bed and looking up at this you know, very sterile ceiling. And I closed my eyes and I thought about myself as a child. And I had this vision of myself as a young child, innocent, um, you know, holding on to dreams of ways that I could change the world. Because when I was little, I always figured, you know, I want to change the world, but I didn't really know how. And it's really interesting for someone who doesn't even know about suffering in the world to want to change the world. And so I remember having a vision of myself as a young girl. And then after that, I had a vision of myself as a woman. And I literally had the vision of myself standing in front of people and talking to them about about you know self-image and self-identity and trying to alleviate them from never having to experience what I went, was going through at that current moment. And even after having that vision, I didn't know if I was gonna survive. I, I was still ready to embrace the end of my existence, but um, the doctors ended up you know, pulling some things and, and I fell asleep and I woke up and it was a miracle. And it was, it was that, you know, waking up from that, I was like, okay, well, you know, this is my, this is my goal, this is my mission, like I have to do this. And I will tell you that, Recovering from a mental illness with the highest mortality rate because eating disorders, anorexia, and bulimia, they do have the highest mortality rate out of all mental illnesses. And recovering from that will be the hardest thing I believe I will ever have to do in my life. Um, you know, most people, you know, suffer for the rest of their lives or they sadly die from heart failure. And so for me, the, the incredible thing that my body did was in order to save my heart, my body ended up cutting off circulation to my legs. And we didn't find this till later, but as, as I was recovering from my eating disorder, I ended up getting a very rare illness called the vascular necrosis, where the blood stops flowing to the bones. And the doctors told me that I would need to get two full hip replacements um, or I would lose my legs. So, uh, you know, after, after going through that, it was, it was really just this incredible journey and kind of like a fight for my life. But the really thing that pushed me through it was that vision that I had that, that day of, you know, wanting to help others of like wanting to, you know, not let anyone else go through what I was going through. And, um, luckily I ended up, I ended up getting to college and, um, it was in college where I really started to explore, my mission and I really started to take my story and figure out, you know, that, that I didn't go through all this for no reason. So, you know, as we were talking before I, in college, I wrote a story about it and my professor was like, this is way too powerful. You have to talk about it uh, to the class. And so I told the class and, you know, it was really powerful for them. And then 
I ended up meeting with another mentor and I started, you know, talking about it publicly to the college. And then I, I did an event and then over time it ended up turning into, you know, my mission now, which is to talk to other people about, you know, self identity, self image, and you know, how that affects us. Like there's a lot of cultural conditioning that goes into the way that we perceive ourselves. Yes. And um, I learned a lot of that. A lot of that is personal experience, the things that I talk about. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is, is all coming together for me. And it was in that same time that I was starting to do these speeches that I also was starting to dance. And for me, dancing was just kind of this outlet for expression. It was a way for me to take everything that I had been through and just kind of translate it into, because I was, you know, obviously there's so much emotion that goes on throughout all of this. Um, you know, there's a lot of dark, dark times and there's also this incredible appreciation for life. You know, for me, as I was coming out of that, I remember that, you know, I had this journal where I would write what recovery was to me. And there's just pages and pages of, you know, me imagining recovery for myself when I was in the depths of my eating disorder. And, you know, on one of those pages, it was to be able to see a sunset for what it is and to see the beauty in it and to not feel numb by it. Wow. And I remember that, you know, I was riding my bike after I had been recovering and I saw all the beauty again. And I remember just stopping and just like crying and just being like, this is my life. Like I, I developed such an incredible appreciation for life because of what I went through. And so all of that was just a lot of emotions constantly running through me from, you know, translating chaos to, to beauty. And, um, that's, you know, again, where the dancing came in and I would like, I'd be in my room and I would dance, you know, with my eyes closed. And I remember I would just cry and I would just let it all out. And I would just like feel my body and I would allow myself to really feel into myself and to feel all the amazing things that my body allows me to do. And um, after time, I ended up going to these events. And I remember I used to be that, that chick, the weird chick in the corner, <laughs> dancing with her eyes closed. Right. Um, because for me, it was, it was all about expression. It wasn't, it wasn't really a social thing. It was more so I just wanted to be in, immersed in the music. Got so it. I'd like find somewhere close to the speaker. Oh, yeah, I used to be a raver. You know, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it was all kinds of events. You know, I, I was, I'm huge on music. I do a lot. I love all kinds of music. And so I'd go to like anything from reggae to EDM to all kinds of events. And I'd always go alone. And I was, you know, it was, just, it was interesting. Um, but I'd go and I, like I said, I, I just closed my eyes and I would just move into it until finally people actually started to take notice. And they're like, what are you doing? You're, you're pretty good. And then I was like, cool, I guess I am pretty good. Like if other people think I am. And so um, eventually what happened was I started to get better and I started to like, you know, explore it even more. And I would go to this, these events and then I, you know, I had friends of course. And at one event, I remember I went and uh, I was at the very front of the stage and they had this beautiful mandala and I was sitting there tracing it with my hands. And, um, I was so into it until all of a sudden this guy walked up behind me and he had a speaker and he tapped on my shoulder and I literally thought I was in trouble. I was like, I turned around and I was like, oh my goodness, this is like a security guard. Right. And he ended up being the stage manager. And the stage manager was like, this that you're doing, can you do that? But like up there. What? <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, that was the first time. And I remember that like, that was the moment where that was like the pivotal point of me going from just this, this chick dancing, expressing her heart, yeah. you know, you know, being offered to be able to share that with the world. And it was in that moment that I was like, kind of like, not sure. And then I saw my girlfriend, she was behind him and she saw what was happening and she just shook her head. She's like, yes, do it, do yeah. it. <laughs> so honestly, like I and I honestly attribute that to her because I really think that being able to get in front of people sometimes requires a push. And for yeah. for me, she was my push. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And so he took me by the hand and he like brought me up behind stage. And I remember he brought me past like all my favorite artists. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Wow. And then he took me up and he goes, 
I'll never forget it. He goes, um, the stage is all yours. But then he, he stopped me and he said, but don't forget that we found you. <laughs> oh, wow. Do you still have a, do you still know that guy today? Yeah, know? yeah. I, um, I see him, that event, it's called Gem and Jam. It's in Tucson, Arizona. And um, they invite me back every year to perform. And I see him every year. And we, we've talked about it, about how amazing it is that, you know, I just continue to grow as an artist. And I'll never, you know, forget that it was definitely that event that allowed me that platform to first express my art. Your, your whole story is just one of the most incredible stories that I think we've ever heard. Yes. <laughs> like ever. Like we've interviewed a lot of, we've interviewed hundreds of people. And uh, this is like uh, by far, it seems like um, unimaginable, the sequence of events, how they've unfolded and are continuing to unfold. Um, right. There's, there's uh, definitely, um, you know, you're, you're meant to be doing what you're doing. And it's, it's a higher purpose and a higher calling. And the, the cool thing is I know you're aware of that. And, um, and there, and there's a, there, there's an awareness within you that understands that. So that's, mm -hmm. um, do you have, what, what would be if, if you have a team listening to this right now and they're, they've, they've let part of themselves become numb because, you know, let's face it, you know, like uh, a lot of teens have to put a shell over themselves just to kind of go to school. Um, they have to, you know, wear a lot of different masks. We all do as human beings, we have to put on all these different masks. Um, but a lot of times then it will, it'll, it'll partially or even fully numb us to life. What, what would you say to a teen that is starting to numb themselves now and how can they pull themselves out and really start to live life truly? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the biggest things that I think is so incredibly important, especially for teens, is really understanding who you are as a person um, and how you fit into this world and how you can be distinguished from other people. Um, you know, I feel that a lot of times in this world, you know, we live in a world that is very based off um, validation from others or trying to put out an image that is perceived as you know, successful constantly. And we were talking about the social media. The right, and that, that's, 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 it definitely has a lot to do with, you know, social media realm and also how just the media in general perceives right. us. So in that, you know, it's really easy to get lost in the translation of, you know, who am I? Especially when you're constantly being bombarded with these, with these images of, you know, telling you who you should be and how you should look. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what I would tell them is that it's really incredibly important to really sink into yourself and understand who you are, your identity, um, and to really understand the concept of what self-image is. And so self-image is, you know, as we talked about, is definitely something that exists only in your mind. And so for someone who is constantly worrying about failure, constantly worrying about how other people, you know, may perceive them. Yes. Um, that is someone who is constantly projecting their self image into a future situation that hasn't even happened yet. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're projecting yourself into feeling, you know, failure, you are literally putting your body through experiencing feelings of, you know, shame, guilt, embarrassment, fear. And, the reality of it is, is that if we spent even just half as much time as we did imagining success as we do failure, um, we could allow our bodies to truly feel into what it feels like to, you know, be successful. But in order to do that, it really requires us to know ourselves and to know our own identity. And so, you know, as we talked about is how, how do you figure out who you truly are I think that that comes from a thought experiment of, of really stripping yourself. If you were, everything was to be taken from you, your family, your friends, your possessions, your belongings, all of your materialistic things, um, if you were just to be left alone with no one around, just you, would you even know who you are? Wow. And, um, right there, yeah. And so, yeah, and you know, those things you could, and you could go about, this is, this is where self-identity comes in, is you could describe yourself by your name, by your, by your age, by your physical descriptions, but all of that is really just kind of like an external part of your identity. 
And so even if that was to be taken from you, you know, what makes you you? And I think that that, that really comes in as too far, as far as like the qualities, the values, the morals that you have as a person. Um, so like, for instance, if, if you were to lose your family, you were to lose everything, um, would you still be a courageous person? Would you still be driven, you know, willing to help others? Are you the kind of person that stands up for others? Um, are you the kind of person that, you know, maybe loves to cook or maybe loves to create um, because you, you see the benefit that it does for other people? Uh, those are the characteristics and the qualities that are really important for us to really set into and understand about ourselves because those are the things that can't be taken from us, especially our morals and our values. Um, so I think that, you know, for, for teens who are definitely caught in this realm of, you know, who am I? What is my purpose? It really is this big thing of, of identity crisis. And um, it really takes understanding your identity and how you can project yourself into, you know, a successful situation and understanding your purpose through that. That's incredible. So um, they can probably explore a lot of different things with that journal writing or meeting meeting with people that can mentor them through. Because I mean, I'm sure that it can be uh, a lot of teens feel alone, you know, and that's where a lot of the depression comes in. And like you said, uh, in, in the, when we talked earlier, people reach out to Google, but they don't have people to reach out to. Exactly. Um, no, yeah, that's huge. Um, you know, uh, the, the big thing with social media is that social media, if it's used with awareness and with intent, it can definitely prove to be a productive tool, whether it be for your pro professional or personal life. Yeah. Sadly, however, that's not the case for a lot of people. A lot of people get stuck into, you know, this constant cycle of trying to, um, and it is a lot about self-image. They're trying to project themselves onto other people and showing them, you know, well, this is how awesome I am. And here's and my highlight reel. Kind of subconscious though, right? It's not, they're, they're not trying to, they don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to show the world I'm awesome. It's just all subconscious because they're taking that in, right? Right, exactly. It's, it's constant just like reflecting how, you know, the world is at this point. And so um, what that really does though, is that again, the, the subconscious is a big part of this because subconscious is, you know, it's just like a recorder. It's constantly recording things. And um, you know, it's also happening when you don't even realize it. And so, you know, a lot of these, like I said, a lot of these studies have been coming out about, you know, linking depression to social media. And one of the biggest factors is social comparison. And again, people are doing this without even realize that they're doing it is that when you're going through, you know, these Instagram profiles or these Facebook profiles, you're literally comparing yourself and you may not even realize you're doing it, but you're, you're looking at their profile and you're like, wow, they, they've got a great family. They're, you know, they're traveling. This is amazing. And then sometimes internally you're like, I wish I could be doing that. Why am I not doing that? Uh, I feel bad that I'm not doing that and like I should be doing that and I'm, I'm a you know, lower person because of that. And so this is constantly happening and that's why you know, depression has become more prevalent, especially with the use of social media. Um, and again, this all ties back into you know, like really trying to understand who you are because when you're constantly you know, looking through these different profiles, you are constantly taking in what that is and so, you know, the, the big concept with that is that your mind cannot distinguish, and this is, this is science agrees, that your mind cannot distinguish the difference between reality and an imagined experience. Right. So, and this is why television and media is so, it has such a profound effect on people, is because when you're watching things or when you're watching the highlight reel of someone else, you're literally taking that in and as if like, you're right in front of them. Um, so this, you know, really starts to affect your behaviors. And so, yeah, I mean, social comparison is, is really scary. And that was another big thing for me is that, you know, in my eating disorder, I, I didn't have, you know, Facebook at the time, but I had like Teen Vogue magazine and like America's Next Top Model, like that kind of stuff. And that was back then. So today, the fact that people so close to us were able to compare ourselves and like the amount of people on social media is just, it's insane. There's just these constant ways to compare ourselves to other people and even people that are close to us. 
Yes. So, um, Brittany, yeah, like hearing from you, this is incredible. It's actually uh, spurring in so many more different questions. Like, I'm sure we're going to have a series. We're going to probably start a, like a talk show right now. <laughs> a series. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. There's a lot of topics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but, you know, I definitely encourage uh, anyone listening to this right now or watching this right now to go and check out your video that you just released. It's amazing. And then how else can people reach out to you if they want you for a speaking gig or if they want to reach out for you with any coach? I'm not sure what you offer, but how can people find you? Yeah, um, well, you can go to my website. It's uh, Brittany Quitting. It's B R I T T A N Y. Last name Q-U-I-D-A-N-G uh, dot com. And right there I have I have a little thing. It says, Can I keep you posted? Um, so you can drop your email in there and I'd be happy to get back to you. You know, I, I definitely answer emails directly. Um, you know, another way is obviously to follow me you know, on social media, not in a way that, you know, it's against what I'm talking about, but um, like I said, <laughs> I think social media can be used productively if right. it is to you know reach out towards others um, and help others so yeah I, I do have uh, my my Facebook which is also um, Brittany quitting um, and you can reach out to me there definitely um, so any of those platforms are a great way to follow up with me um, to see what I'm doing next and so on very cool well consider us your number one fans Woo! <laughs> Uh, closing um you know to that to that one team that's listening right now if you were to just to have a powerful um you know closing to them directly to them mm -hmm. what would you say to that team just to to give them that that lifeline that mm -hmm. they might need to hear at this time in their life mm -hmm do not have to live up to the expectations of everyone else and you are worthy enough and you are loved enough and you have a purpose for humanity. If you can just learn to own yourself and own your identity and learn to develop a healthy self image, then the world is yours really all the doors will open for you as long as you just become your authentic self. I love that. Brittany. Brittany, good day, everyone. <laughs> wow. Thank you so, so much. That was so amazing. Usually I speak, but I just had to soak in that whole experience. I mean, just so much wisdom, you know, just the fact that you're, you're self-taught. I love hearing that self-taught, you know, mm -hmm. you've been through the Harvard of life, yeah. you know, and that's, what's giving you the credentials to be able to uh, have people just really sit down and listen to you and be able to um, soak in the knowledge and, mm -hmm. and, and the mastery that you've been able to create, you know, and I'm really believing that and knowing that through this uh, podcast, you know, that people are going to be touched. People are going to be blessed and people are going to be moved. And mm -hmm. we're really knowing for you too, as well, that it's just going to open up a tremendous amount, a flood of opportunities for you um, mm -hmm. that are just going to continue to come your way just because of the giving heart and the love that you have. And it just, it, it really just radi radiates off of you. And uh, like I said, you just sat, you sat me right in my seat and it was just a teaching lesson, really. It's just a tremendous, tremendous blessing you are, Brittany. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys so much for allowing me this platform to speak about this. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. We'll talk I'm again. To have met you. <laughs> yeah. We met for a reason, Brittany. Yeah, it's true. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> All right. Much love to you. Thank you so much, Brittany. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome, Brittany. Bye-bye. Talk All to right. you soon. Take care.